This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Hanam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, the situation in Gaza remains grim. The Israeli military has invaded Rafah and is planning for a, yet another all-out assault. They've captured the Rafah crossing so that no aid is currently getting in from the Rafah crossing right now. And with the American pier that was built to bring in aid is barely bringing in 50 to 70 trucks a day when Palestinians need 500 trucks a day just to ward off famine. The situation is grim. Fighting has uh, resumed in the north right now. There are at least 20 uh, medical uh, personnel, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers who are stuck in Gaza and are unable to leave. The situation remains grim, Jamal, and we're going to be covering all of that today on Arab Talk. We're going to be covering the attacks in Rafah despite the objections of the U.S. government. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is expected to announce more orders on the on Israel soon. We'll be hearing about that. And after weeks and weeks and weeks of student protests, U- U.S. universities are granting hearings and agreeing to student demonstrator demands on considering divestment from Israel. It's a major development, Jamal. But before we get to that, we're going to watch a really uh, fantastic interview that you did with Arwa uh, Damon. She's the former CNN senior international correspondent and founder of INARA, which is the International Network for Aid, Relief, and Assistance. She's going to talk about her recent visit to southern Gaza and the scale of the humanitarian crisis there. It's a really great interview. That's right, Jess. And she is one of the few who actually entered into Gaza, as you know. Israel prevents journalists from going into Gaza, and therefore we only get reporting from uh, Al Jazeera and other Palestinian journalists, and Israel have been targeting them that by now more than 114, some, uh, you know, um, surveys show that have been killed uh, by by Israel. But let's first uh, watch Arwa Damon. The International Rescue Committee states that the scale of the humanitarian crisis in southern Gaza defies imagination as Israeli ground forces invade Rafah. More than 1.4 million Palestinians in Gaza have been made refugees several times over since Israel began its assault in October 2023. Already suffering from a long-standing siege, Palestinians are now being squeezed into smaller and smaller spaces that offer neither sanctuary nor food, water, or other basic essentials of life. A high percentage of them are children. Convoys of aid trucks uh, trying to enter Gaza from the West Bank on a special army road were rampaged and set afire by Israeli settlers, while Israeli military convoy escorts did nothing to stop the attack. Joining us on Arab Talk this week is Arwa Damon, the president and founder of INARA, International Network for Aid, Relief, and Assistance. It is a nonprofit providing mental and medical care to children in areas impacted by war and natural disasters. She has recently been in southern Gaza to assess the situation. Arwa Damon is a journalist and former longtime CNN senior international correspondent. She founded INARA in 2015 after bearing witness to the suffering of children in war zones for over a decade and a half. Welcome to Arab Talk, Arwa. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's start by you telling us about INARA, what its mission is, and how in these dire circumstances in Gaza you seek to alleviate some of the suffering and trauma children are experiencing. So we have something of a dual purpose. Our core sort of mission, our core program centers around being able to provide long-term and guaranteeing long-term medical and mental health care for children with severely complex injuries. And, you know, what we've seen in Gaza is that the vast majority of, of children have sustained these kinds of injuries. You know, whether it's multiple fractures, whether it's severe burns, whether it's a combination of 
you know, multiple types of injuries. What we know based on our experience is that these children are going to need years and years of medical support and treatments. We also know in the mental health space that they are going to need years and years of support. So we have that at our core objective right now. We're obviously still very much in, in what we call the, the emergency situation, right? The, the bombardment is still happening. The, the trauma triggers are still part of you know, the, the daily rhythm of life. And, and as such, what we do in this particular situation is we look to see what, what activities we can implement uh, in, in the mental health space. Uh, with children. And then we also look to see what we can provide to the community as a whole. And what this means is that we're doing everything from, you know, uh, food parcel distributions, rewashable uh, sanitary underwear, baby milk, baby powder, shoes, children's clothes. I mean, the, the, the need is so great in Gaza right now anyways, that anything that anyone can get in is, is a drop of something. Well, you've mentioned Gaza, you've been uh, recent, you've recently visited southern Gaza. Describe really what the, what life is like there uh, for the population and and what you saw and, and and your own experience. It's not life, right? It it's not life in in its day to day rhythm, and people are not alive. I have been in war zones for almost 20 years now, anywhere from, you know, Iraq to Afghanistan and everywhere in between. And, you know, death and destruction always comes with war. Displacement always comes with war. And we have this horrible, you know, tendency to to normalize certain types of, of suffering as just being, you know, it, it's a byproduct of war, uh, which which is a, a false narrative because there's always ways to, to ease that. But I say all this to, to bring to the point of there was something and there is something about Gaza that is starkly different to anywhere else that I've been that goes beyond the volume and the scale and the depth and, scro- and scope of the destruction and of the killing. And that is the pure and total psychological obliteration that you see. And by this, I mean people are dead inside. That spark of life that you and I have, that you know most people have, Gazans don't have that anymore. You see it in their eyes; they're blank. You see it in their movements, which are mechanical and and lethargic. And it's this crush and swell of people that are just crammed up against each other, each one fighting so hard to find the strength to be able to breathe and. To be able to, you know, just share one example of of the depth of all of this, I met a mother who came up and and was talking to to us about her seven year old son, and she was saying, "Look, I don't know what to do because every night my son starts screaming and he rocks back and forth, and I feel like he's about to go into a seizure." She says, "You know, he he started doing this uh, ever since he saw his younger sister decapitated." She was decapitated by a bomb. Now, what this mother was saying was horrific enough. But what was perhaps even more jarring than that was the realization that she was also there. She also witnessed this. And yet her tone of voice was very level. It was very monotone. And that's when you realize that she cannot be emotional. She cannot allow that tiniest little sliver of emotion to even break through into her tone of voice because if she allows herself that, she is going to shatter into a million pieces. And I was sort of, you know, stunned into silence by by what she was saying and this thought process I was having. And it was almost as if she read my mind because she looked at me and she said, I know. She said, I know, but my other children need me. Well, I mean... That this is really heartbreaking, but also shows the resilience that people have there. I mean, to to be able to even speak with you. Yeah, I mean, look, and then when you talk to Gazans, though, about you know, oh, you're you're resilient, right? You know, into Samzin, into Sabrin, like you know, you're you're standing strong, you're being patient. They don't necessarily like that description because they don't want it. They don't want to be the people that is constantly and consistently forced to deal with these different, increasingly atrocious 
levels of, of inhumane conditions that they're, that they're trying to survive. And we need to, I think, to a certain degree, you know, recognize that as tough and as strong as Gazans are, they are breaking in ways that we cannot even imagine physically and psychologically. They are crushed. It's too much. And you really get the sense that I'm in awe of the fact that literally everyone has not fallen off the edge of a mental psychological abyss. It's amazing. So Israel states that uh, it directs Palestinians to evacuate the humanitarian zones when it is preparing an onslaught on a neighborhood in Gaza. Who in the Israeli military coordinates or designates these humanitarian zones? Are they actually set up as such? No, and let's be very clear about, you know, a couple of things. And, you know, w we need to call out a lie or an exaggeration of, of a situation as it is. When Israel tells a population to move to what it classifies as being a humanitarian zone, there is nothing about the area that the Gazan population is being told to move to that remotely comes close to being anything that would resemble a humanitarian zone. There is zero, or very close to zero, coordination and pre-coordination between Israel and humanitarian entities on the ground in Gaza that would even allow for something to be set up. Humanitarian organizations on the ground in Gaza are constantly struggling with lines of communication with the Israeli side. And this ranges from setting up or trying to figure out where and how to set up humanitarian zones or something that would remotely resemble that, but also in this whole deconfliction process, right? So in a war zone, you have what's known as deconfliction. And that is when, as an aid organization, you are in communication with all warring parties to try to ensure the safety of your humanitarian convoys, your staff, and your personnel to be able to deliver aid. This has not, does not, never has properly worked inside Gaza to date. And the starkest example of all of this is obviously the direct strike that happened on, on the World Central Kitchen Convoy. Now, when Israel is talking about humanitarian zone, it's an arbitrary area that that is just sort of imposed on the population. And then humanitarian organizations try to somehow scramble to, to, to set up something. But let's be realistic. No one can properly do this. If we even look at what's happening right now with the population in Rafah that are basically being told to move to, you know, Mawasi, to, to Han Yunus, to Deir al-Balah. Mawasi is beachfront. It is sand dunes, and it is already packed with people who already, before the sort of Rafah flow arrived there, did not have proper access to sanitation. There is no toilets. You have hundreds of thousands of people there who do not have a toilet. There is no running water. There is no proper distribution of humanitarian supplies. There are no proper shelters. And the same goes for everywhere. Humanitarian organizations had just started getting a little bit, and I'm talking about a little bit of a system set up in Rafah. The logistics hub was in Rafah. And now all of that has effectively, you know, metaphorically blown up in our faces. And everyone is just trying to scramble to figure out how to redistribute and reset up everything. But it's impossible in a scenario where the goalposts keep shifting mm. without any sort of notification. So, so under these uh, current circumstances, what does Inara do? I mean, what what can you do? I mean, do you prior to, uh, do you have any priorities like, uh, for example, addressing children's trauma that you've mentioned? What what is your priority, or what can you do? You, you literally look and you try to figure out what you actually can do, because there's a number of factors that impede you from carrying out your mission as a humanitarian organization. So. Specifically, when we're talking about mental health interventions for children in this kind of a context where the trauma is ongoing and the triggers are daily, what that really looks like is creating a distraction for the children, right? So it's playtime, it's activities, it's games, it's trying to provide them sort of an outlet for their energy, for their anger, for all of these emotions that they don't know how to process. But it is effectively you know, barely even a Band-Aid solution. It's a temporary distraction. But for example, the situation that we're in right now is that we have trucks of, you know, children's shoes, children's clothing. It's summer. Remember, people fled, you know, with their winter clothes 
if, if anything, no one has summer clothing. We have diapers, we have baby powder, we have all of this stuff that is so needed that is right now stuck stuck in Egypt. Supplies inside Gaza are, are running out across the board. Nothing has gotten in pretty much since May 5th. A few dozen commercial trucks got into the north, but they're commercial trucks and they got into the north. Gaza is now sort of this patchwork of, of areas of inaccessibility. So now Rafah is facing and the southern part are facing increasingly dire humanitarian situations. And it is the worst feeling in the world to be in a situation where you know that you can provide a person with what they need. You just can't get what it is that they need across this border through this war zone and to that human being as well. So uh, famine now has come to Gaza after months of warning of it being imminent. Uh, what is the casualty forecast that will result both from this and lack of access to basic medical care alone? Right. So the World Health Organization was talking about, you know, has, uh, famine already arrived to northern Gaza weeks and weeks ago, and we've already had dozens of children uh, dying due to due to famine and due to starvation. We also need to keep in mind that in many cases, the vast majority of the time, uh, a child does not necessarily directly die from famine or starvation. They die because their body is so weak that it cannot fight disease and their organs start to shut down. We're already seeing this in the North. And now there are warnings that it is going to spread very quickly to the South. You know, on the one hand, if one wants to be extraordinarily morbid looking at this whole entire situation, one could argue that, you know, Israel isn't necessarily killing the population just with, you know, the 1,000, 2,000 pound dumb bombs that it's, that it's dropping on entire neighborhoods, but also killing the population through the deprivation of food. And then on top of all of that, deprivation of the proper nutrients and specific sort of treatments that are needed to be able to combat severe levels of malnutrition and of famine itself. We need to also remember in a context where the medical infrastructure has been completely eradicated, that lack of access to medical care for treatable diseases and illnesses also results in death. You have a spread of things like diarrhea. Diarrhea is the leading global killer of children under the age of five. This is worldwide. Cases of diarrhea in Gaza are out of control. You have cholera. You have hepatitis A. So you have all of these compounding factors that are resulting and going to result in an ever-increasing death toll on top of the deaths that are being caused directly by the bombs and the bullets. So uh, you've mentioned thousands of trucks are stuck at the border. They're, they're not uh, letting. They're not letting them in, or they're just basically controlling the movement there. But today or yesterday, uh, the uh, I saw a report that the sea bridge now is operable. Do you feel that this is going to make a dent or a change, or just for show and uh, PR? that we are finding another solution to let aid in through the sea into Gaza. I mean, we, we all say to take into consideration the absurdity of the need to even build a sea bridge when there is a viable land option. We need to look at the absurdity of carrying out airdrops that have killed people when there is a land access option. A sea bridge is not and cannot and never will be a substitute for the sort of sustained access that land crossings can provide. The sea bridge has a very complex mechanism where, you know, the, the goods and the ships are inspected in Cyprus, and then they come and they land on the floating pier, and then from there it's moved to I don't know where, and everything gets loaded and offloaded a bunch of times. Then in theory, it eventually ends up in Gaza. Here's another issue, though. There are dwindling fuel supplies in Gaza. So this sea bridge might very well get humanitarian supplies, a measure of them, into Gaza, but without fuel. How are humanitarian organizations supposed to pick those up and distribute them? This is very much something of a sort of intermediary option, perhaps for certain parties, or let's just call it, for the United States to be able to say, look, we are actually doing something. 
But again, like my mind, and I've been in this space of, you know, war and military operations, as I was saying earlier, for 20 years now. My mind cannot wrap itself around this notion that the United States cannot get its number one ally in the region, arguably in the world, to open a land crossing and has to resort to building a highly expensive and grossly ineffective sea bridge. Something is wrong in the calculus here. Well, assuming it, it starts, how are uh, aid organizations like yours are going to feel safe transporting uh, the supplies from there? I mean, knowing what happened to uh, the uh, in, with the uh, international kitchen, kitchen humanitarian workers, you don't feel safe. I mean, that's you do not feel safe. I mean, is that a guarantee? of any sort by the United States or any of the countries with influence on Israel not to target humanitarian organizations or, or aid workers on the ground? Well, I think that therein sort of lies, you know, the bigger challenge is that the U.S. can guarantee all it wants, assuming it even does. But that guarantee means nothing because we've already heard the United States and, you know, Secretary Blinken and 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 even you know President Biden talking about the need to protect humanitarians, talking about the need to protect um, journalists, talking about the need to protect the civilian population, and none of it has amounted to anything. There is it really feels, especially when you're on the ground there, that there is nothing that can guarantee you. You are constantly you're playing Russian roulette, whether you're out there delivering aid or trying to report the news or just trying to get your kid you know, a loaf of bread. You are constantly, every single minute in Gaza, playing Russian roulette with your life. Well, the biggest challenge also, aside from bringing uh, supplies and aid to people, and if you mentioned children, is the, uh, you know, most people talk about the physical effect on people, the death, the destruction, the injuries, but they don't talk about the mental health. You started talking about the mental health and the specifically with children. How... You know, from what you've seen there, how can even therapists and doctors deal with this? You know, now, now, unfortunately, now is not the time, right? Like you can't go into the sort of in-depth work that needs to be done with a child or with an adult while these triggers are all are all still there. What I do know from experience, though, is that with children, that spark of life, it can slowly be be coaxed back. The, the scars, the mental scars, you never fully eradicate them, ever, not in anybody. That's impossible. No one ever actually recovers from a trauma, but what mental health work seeks to do is soften those scars to such a degree that they are no longer completely debilitating. But what we also need to recognize, too, is you know the different scales of, of trauma. Every single child in Gaza right now, there's about a million of them, is going to need some sort of mental health intervention. And then there are those whose number is unknown, but tens and tens of thousands of children who are going to need severe, severe in-depth work. I've met children who have lost the ability to speak due to the depth of the trauma that they have gone through. I met a little boy named Ahmed at a hospital in Cairo. He saw his, um, his parents and his younger sibling die. He was the only survivor and no one knew that he had survived. So he actually was alone in a hospital for about 11 days before his grandfather found him. And he, the first time I met him, he was very non-reactionary, right? Um, and he had lost his ability to, to formulate any sentences when I saw him, but he was out of the context. He was in Egypt. A little bit of work was already starting with him. So when I saw him a few weeks later, he was out of you know the hospital bed. He ran down the hall the hallway at me. He he was smiling, mm. but he still wasn't talking. You know, I met another uh, teenage girl who was basically so traumatized. Um, the doctors couldn't find anything physically wrong with her, but she was unable to move from the chest down. And so slowly, with physical therapy, they begun to work on her as well. But this is a very important aspect when we talk about the sort of the the days after and the phases after that often really does get neglected, which is the mental health of a population. 
we cannot neglect that because otherwise the population has no chance whatsoever at growing and developing and regaining control over their own life. What about orphans? Do we even have a number of how many children have been left, you know, orphans? Now they are no, lost their families. No, no. And it's it's very unclear. And even inside Gaza, you know, I was asking about this, but there's no, you know, there there's no sort of centralized orphanage where these these orphans are being, you know, taken to. Uh, you know, the, that horrific acronym that came out, you know, wounded child, no surviving family. Those those kids have sort of been you know spread out and and dispersed. Um, a, you know, a handful of them have have gotten out um, with extended family members. But you also know what it's like, right? Where if there's an extended family member, they will take them in. Mm-hmm. But all of these other children, they're effectively just being sort of looked after by by who whoever it is. I mean, there's it's such chaos, it's such madness, it's such insanity. And the thing is, is, and this is also what my mind sort of struggles to wrap itself around, is that everything seems to be being done to just make it even harder and aggravate what is already an impossible to navigate situation. If and when the situation st- stabilizes, what kinds of programs would Inara undertake? So we would, in in the first phases, look at probably at a multi-pronged approach. So what what we kind of do is we look at what everybody else is doing in terms of uh, aid and other humanitarian supplies to be provided. And we kind of take the little bits that others are not necessarily addressing or a population that isn't getting a portion of what it needs. But once the day overcomes, our key and main focus is going to very much shift more towards the medical and the mental health space. So it's going to very much be about setting up mental health programs for children inside Gaza itself, and then starting the work of identifying and building out the programs for those children who are going to need years and years and years of medical surgical interventions. Because what we do is when we take on a child, we say to the child, and this is very important to the family as well, we've got you. We know that the doctors have assessed that your child is going to need three to five surgeries, but you don't need to stress about that because we're not just providing you one surgery. We're providing the full course of treatment and anything else that you might need. And then we also take a holistic approach. So if the child is not able to heal because of community-based factors, family-based factors, lack of access to education, we look in and we try to build interventions around that space too. But we also need to keep in mind that Gaza is basically rubble. There is zero infrastructure um, to be able to start with inside. So it, it ends up really being this whole exercise in in mental gymnastics when it comes to trying to see how it is that that we are able to, to provide certain needs. But it is very much going to then pivot a lot to mental health and medical long-term treatment, setting up sustainable programs. I want to to put your journalist hat on and uh, comment on like as of today, a committee to protect journalists reports 105 journalists have been killed in Gaza, hundreds of them are Palestinian. Other number, other there are other figures that puts it as high as 114, 115. Another 16 were injured, 25 arrested. In addition to this, journalists' family members have been targeted, threatened. Where is the outcry by international media? It's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. Um, sadly, the the international media's sort of collective voice when it comes to standing by our Palestinian colleagues has been sorely, very sorely lacking. And there is a significant and understandable degree of frustration Um among the Palestinian Gazan journalistic community, because not only has the response been fairly muted when it comes to the number of journalists killed in Gaza, but so too, to a certain degree, has been the effort to try to force Israel to allow the outside media into Gaza. 
We need to be very clear, and I believe that every single international organization needs to repeat this over and over again in every single report. The reason why the international media is not in Gaza is because Israel will not permit the international press to report freely and independently from Gaza itself, and that needs to change. And I can tell you, having been in there, if the press gets in there and starts doing the job that it is very well equipped to do that our gods and colleagues have been doing so, so well up until now, things will change. And very, very quickly. Israel continuously uses, you know, the the excuse of, you know, danger and risk. Look, I, I, I did this for a very, very long time. And I talk to my, you know, journalist friends all the time. Everyone's willing to undertake that risk. Everyone wants to go to Gaza. Everyone wants Israel to allow access to Gaza. Well, in your 20 years of reporting from war zones, have you witnessed this high number of casualties or this the targeting of journalists, whether it be it in Iraq, Syria, or other places? No, not in that short of a time. Um, not not in that not with that level of intensity. Um, and I most certainly bar, you know, a couple of occasions, but not even then. Here's the other thing we need to remember is in these other war zones, you know, did ISIS threaten journalists um, who were trying to feed us information from, for example, Mosul? Absolutely. But that was ISIS. Did the Syrian regime deliberately target citizen journalists and, you know, social media activists who were feeding us footage and information? Yes, absolutely. But that's ISIS and the Syrian regime. Did the Russians deliberately try to target journalists? Yes, but that's Russia. None of these entities are a democratically elected nation state that, again, is a very close ally to the United States that claims to be the world's leading democracy. We are seeing behaviors that do not logically make sense for a country that identifies itself as being a state and that is welcomed and embraced by the Western world. All other entities, countries, you name it, that have carried out this kind of behavior have either been international pariahs or labeled as terrorist organizations. If people want to help Inara in whatever capacity, if there's something they can do, what should they do? Uh, we are always eternally grateful for um, donations, obviously. But then there's also great ways to get, you know, an entire community um, involved. So, you know, we've had kids who have come together to try to raise money for a particular family or for, you know, a particular child's uh, treatment. We have had people who, when it's their birthday or when it's their child's birthday, in lieu of gifts, ask for you know, donations. And, you know, if you go to our social media pages, you can constantly, you know, keep track of the activities that we're doing. Um, and it's also, it's just as important to to keep raising awareness and also to recognize, and this is, I, I do think this is very important because so many people feel so helpless and so hopeless. And I, I do as well a lot of the time. And I constantly have to remind myself that even if I'm not able to help every single human being that I want to, even if I don't have a magic wand that can just get everything to everyone, that does not take away the power and the impact of being able to reach the few. Just because we're only able to help the few, it's still just as important as helping the many. For more information about Inara, the website is Inara. I-N-A-R-A dot org. Uh, check it out. Try to help. Arwa Damon, thank you for coming on Arab Talk and thank you for helping uh, the children in, in Gaza. Thank you for having me. That's the voice in the face of Arwa Damon. She's the former CNN senior uh, international count, uh, correspondent and founder of Inara the International Network for Aid, Relief, and Assistance. Jamal, it's a very compelling interview. I mean, Arwa is a senior international correspondent. She's been reporting from the Arab world and North Africa for decades now. She gives a very grim picture. 
Yeah, you've used the the word grim several times, yes, and uh, I can't agree anymore. I mean, that's that's the situation. There is a humanitarian crisis, a major crisis ongoing in Gaza, and what Arwa witnessed is beyond pale. And we actually had discussions about not only the physical damage, but this is something of your interest, the mental damage to both adults and children. Uh, you know, children who have witnessed the, the death of an entire family or witnessed their siblings getting killed in front of their eyes. And the people there are just basically shell-shocked. I mean, we talk about uh, perseverance. And I mean, I don't know what level of perseverance can you have and and power and and sustainability to witness what has been going in into in Gaza when you have entire families eradicated, when you have when you have a child just like four or five years old witnessing the death of uh, his or her sister uh, who's uh, uh, three years old and witnessing the death of their father and mother, and they're basically now orphans. So that's uh, the description. Y- yeah, that and we see it I- from Arwa. Yeah, and 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 the reason I use Grimm, Jamal, is not only based on what Arwa has said, but I've been speaking with colleagues who are on the ground right now in Gaza at the medical uh, hospitals in in the south. One of which is still open, the Emirati Hospital, which is barely open, and the stories that I'm hearing from doctors and nurses on the ground in Gaza right now will make will make any. Any any human being, let alone a doctor, just curl with uh, absolute horror and disgust. I mean, I've spoken with trauma surgeons, Jamal, who worked in the inner city of uh, San Francisco, in Detroit, of Boston, some of the most uh, difficult trauma centers in the entire world, who are saying to me that they have to bear witness to, to trauma, to children and adults that is unlike anything they've ever seen in their entire careers uh, you know, coming in with wounds with their internal organs just out of their bodies, head injuries with brains coming out of their skulls, children just screaming and writhing in pain because there's no pain medication and they have to amputate limbs. It is an unimaginable situation. And it's all done, Jamal. We have to keep this in mind, both the physical and the psychological trauma that's being leveled on uh, Palestinians right now is by the hands of the Israeli government and its military arm, which is sieging in in Gaza yet again. And that's kind of a segue to our, our segment right now, because despite what the international community is saying, despite what Joe Biden is saying, despite what even some elements within the Israeli war cabinet are saying, you know, who like Benny Gantz, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his military are are going in and they're going in hard on the civilian population in in Rafa right now. There are 700,000 Palestinians who were who had already been displaced uh, to the South Jamal in Rafa who have to leave again where no place to go, no place to live, uh, no food, no water, no shelter. It, and that's part of the reason why I'm using the grim uh, word. And it seems like Israel, Jamal, is refusing, again, to be held accountable or to listen to its biggest benefactor, the United States. Well, I really don't believe that in a way. I feel that there isn't enough pressure by the United States. I cannot imagine. We are the the U.S. and the U.S. taxpayers are funding Israel's military for years to come. You know, before and after, you know, what's going on in Gaza, money keeps flowing into the Israeli military. And just recently, the one uh, small action that was taken by President Biden to stop the latest shipment, but now Congress said, no, no, they're going to go ahead with it. Right is is not exercising pressure on Israel. So the, on one hand, you could say, you know, it's easy to put the blame on Netanyahu. And of course, you will be justified to do so. But at the same time, think about it. The U.S. funds everything, everything, or the entire military, never mind what they receive from Germany or the or, or UK. That's that's nothing compared to what the United States provides Israel from both not only military uh, to USA to support at the United Nations, basically using its veto power to shelter Israel, Israeli war crimes. Do you have senators and uh, writing the ICJ 
and the ICC threatening them basically right. if they, uh, you know, put uh, warrants on Israeli officials. And and then to say, well, we talked to them, you know, you sent Blinken to say, well, we've been talking to Benjamin Netanyahu, but he has not been listening. I don't buy that anymore. I don't buy it. Maybe before you thought, well, you know, uh, this Benjamin Netanyahu, which everybody knows, uh, he's going rogue. Uh, I don't think he'll be going rogue aside from he that he wants to uh, maintain his seat and con- and control so he does not get arrested and put in jail and tried tried and put in jail in Israel. But the fact of the matter, there is green lighting, which started early with President Biden giving the green light and repeating what or parroting what Israel was saying about beheading of babies and, and, and people being burned alive and so forth. And now we're finding out the truth, not only from uh, the Palestinian reporters, but we're also from even CNN and right. other networks who have been outing the lies that Israel keeps basically repeating, you know, from the killing of or the murdering, I would say, of the International World Kitchen uh, human, human rights workers to targeting journalists, to targeting hospitals, to targeting children. And then at the end of the day, the United States says, we cannot allow, we cannot for the, force the Israelis to allow the thousands of trucks waiting at Rafah to enter. And and the and and the hundreds of trucks that have are getting attacked by uh, colonial settlers, that now we have to spend millions of dollars building a sea bridge to bring right. aid into Israel. I mean, it doesn't make sense. If any well, anyone with logic thinks about thinks about that, they will tell you this does not make sense. That we cannot say like even during the time of uh, Ronald Reagan and other president stomping their feet and telling the prime minister of Israel like they've, do, they've done with Shamir and, and Begin and others, cut it out right now or we're well, going to stop all foreign aid. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, Jamal. Uh, the only thing that's different now is that uh, Biden and, and your analysis is uh, completely spot on. Uh, and as we've said on Arab Talk uh, many times before, we can't believe what Biden and the Biden administration is saying, because although they may talk big, we're not quote we're not going to send two thousand pound bombs to Israel anymore. They send and they just sent another billion dollars with with thousand pound bombs and billions more dollars of military aid. So. We don't believe what the Biden administration is saying. We judge them by their actions, and their actions are uh, complete support of what's going on in in the Israeli uh, siege and destruction and genocide of Gaza. Maybe the only thing that is being held back is the ferocity of the genocide. It's a genocide, full stop. 83 Palestinians were killed by the Israeli military just in Rafah yesterday. Uh Maybe without the uh, uh, Biden kind of uh, pretense of uh, putting pressure on Netanyahu, maybe that would be 200. But the reality is, is that the United States is a, is complicit, is a co-conspirator, and the Biden administration, because they know they're, you know, they're they're on a losing battle. All the polls show it. Biden is losing in all these swing states, and he's losing in all the polls to Trump. He has to pretend that he's standing tough with Netanyahu and Israel. But the reality on the ground, Jamal, Palestinians are being killed. Palestinians are starving to death. Aid is not getting in. And the money and the military aid continues to go to Israel unchecked. And you know what's the debate about today? Instead of talking about ending the genocide uh, within the administration, within the Israeli government, it's really just talking about a... uh, What's going to happen or what Afterwards. they're going to agree on after, uh, you know, after this the thing genocide, is, after the genocide and how Gaza might be ruled after the war with Hamas. That's the debate. It's not like about saving the children, feeding the hungry, aside from that air bridge, which really just like a drop in the bucket. 
is they're talking about and they're dreaming about that. I have to say that, like even you know, I mean, the, this is actually exposing a, a crack in the Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government. When you, you mentioned Benny Gatz, who's a centrist member, you know, and we know what are centrists. They centrists is uh, the ones who will kill you as a Palestinian with five bullets instead of seven bullets. That's exactly. a centrist government. And he exactly. threatened to resign if the uh, if the if the right wing government led by Benjamin Netanyahu does not agree by June eight to a day after plan. That's why I call it to a day after plan that we what that would include how Gaza might be ruled after the joke. war with Hamas. So they're not talking about ending the war. They're talking about the future. What's going to happen afterwards? And they think. It's going to be just easy to bring the Palestinian Authority, uh, I, want, I can't call it army or police force, on the top of security, Israeli security yeah, apparatus. Security apparatus on the top of Israeli tanks into Gaza and tell them take care of what's going on on the ground. I That's mean, if, they, if this is if this is what they're thinking, they're smoking crack because it's not it's not going to happen. And and so so now they're thinking they should be thinking about stopping the genocide. This is what millions and millions and millions of people are asking around the globe. And we're seeing it right here in the United States. And that's one of our topic when we come back to it, which is talking about the college uh, campuses. But first, uh, I'm going to talk about the world, uh, the world court, which opens its hearings now just uh, about uh, basically and and even you know like I said, the hearings on the request to halt Israel's Rafah inc incursion. Yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, it's so, unbelievable. So, so so that's that's one of their. This is one of their demands, and they're talking about what's going to happen after we kill everybody in Rafah, basically. Yeah, that's basically the, that's why the the uh, hand hand wringing about the ICJ and all of the descriptions about it and you know Israel this and Israel that it's insulting to the intelligence of the world community who is committed to justice and committed to the end of this genocide in Gaza Jamal because the reality is as you said and you know this is the big discussion what are we going to do afterwards but what about now what what is happening now on the ground i mean now on the ground you know is just beyond what is imaginable by the human mind in terms of the starvation and death that is being brought by the israeli military and the idea of you know can we hold israel accountable can we announce more orders i mean we have to face this reality and you and i've been saying this forever israel acts with impunity and they refuse to be held accountable by anybody or any world order. They do whatever they want. They threaten the ICJ, they threaten the ICC, they use the United States veto power at the United Nations to, to veto any kind of resolution, including, by the way, Jamal, just this last week, yet another attempt to ratify uh, Palestine as an independent member of the United Nations. The United States vetoed that again. So if, if people are trying to listen to what the White House uh, press secretary and uh, advisors are trying to say about how tough Biden is, the reality on the ground is so painfully different, Jamal. The United States is letting is just letting it happen and they are putting pressure on the ICJ and the ICC it's not just Israel the United States is putting pressure too Jamal we know this on the ICJ and the ICC to not do anything to hold Israel accountable it's it's painfully laughable Jamal to hear all this yeah and the fact of the matter you have an ongoing case by South Africa, accusing Israel of violating its obligations to the Genocide Convention, which was filed on But nothing May is 10th. happening. Nothing is and, happening. I mean, I mean nothing. which was filed before. And now you have a new request, also by South Africa, asking the ICJ, ICJ's 15 judges, to order Israel to immediately withdraw and cease its military operations in the Rafah governorate and open up the enclave to international aid workers and journalists. And nothing is happening. 
Nothing. I mean, you have not what, what, why, why do you establish the ICJ? Why do you have these courts if you're just not going to follow their demands? Why do we have the United Nations when you have the United Nations voting in the to, to create you know, a seat for the Palestinian state? And then you have one country and three, four surrogates, I don't know, four or five Palu and 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 Micronesia. Islands. Micronesian people with with maybe the population of uh, small, uh, I would say, segment of San Francisco, exactly to basically control what or to negate the wish of the international community. And you have the same thing now with the ICJ. I mean, we're just kind of like watching this court, and I'm reading all these uh, uh, you know filings and proceedings and. And and meanwhile, every single day you've mentioned, I think today, just I think you mentioned 85 people were killed in Rafah. So every single day you see people are getting killed. And these guys are debating and they're debating and then now they're talking about the day after the war. And who's going to remain the day after the war? Well, Jamal, let's, let's look at the reality. Even if Israel stopped its genocide today in Gaza, even if it stopped it today, you would have tens of thousands of children die from starvation because tens of thousands of Palestinian children have crossed this, this physical, physiological, biological line that they have been starved for so long, unless you admit them to a critical care unit uh, in the United States for them to be you know, refed medically, their bodies cannot absorb food fast enough to ward off the long-term consequences and ultimately death. And they want to talk about what's happening afterwards when we're seeing this genocide and this forced starvation on a civilian population. It's insulting. It is a joke. And as we keep saying time and time again, you know, the fact that the United States is letting this happen and we should be very clear about it. The United States is not just complicit in this, they are supporting this, regardless of what you're hearing. And I don't expect anything to happen at the IC, ICJ, Jamal, or the ICC, because here's the thing. Let's say eventually the ICJ says, okay, Israel committed genocide, but what about the 100,000 Palestinians that they killed? And, and children that they murdered and destruction that is going to be going on for generations and generations and generations. From my perspective, the ICJ uh, has already dropped the ball. The ICC has dropped the ball because they have not been able to stop this murderous genocide that is being um, uh, enacted right now against the Palestinians in Gaza. So, you know, I, I know we talk about it, but in reality, the ICJ and the ICC is a bit of a joke. They serve the interests of these large powers. They have been threatened by Israel and threatened by the United States. We'll put it this way. They're threatened by Israel publicly and then threatened by the United States privately not to do anything. That tells you a little bit about, you know, how they can operate uh, with any kind of independence. They really can't. And one more comment on this topic, because this is something that... Uh... Uh, Arwa May, uh, Damon mentioned yeah. when we were talking, which is really Israel's farce, which is declaring that there are safe zones in Gaza. There's no safe zones. And, and, and this is something that actually was mentioned at the ICJ. You know, this is mentioned by among of be, a bevy of lawyers and experts presenting South Africa's arguments last week. Uh, you know, one of the arguments was talking about the so-called safe zones. And I'm quoting here from what the uh, lawyer, one of the lawyers was talking about, and he said, there is nothing humanitarian about these so-called humanitarian zones. Israel's genocide of Palestinians continues through military attacks and man-made starvation. So this is confirmed even by the ICJ, and, and I should mention, this is a lawyer for South Africa commenting on the so-called safe zones. His name is Max uh, Duplessis. And, and he said, hey, this is uh, nonsense. 
this is nonsense, and that's what the media keeps talking about, you know, asking the people in Gaza. It's like, it's like they're playing a game of soccer with them. Go to the north. No, come back to south. Go to Rafah. No, Rafah now is not safe. We want you to leave Rafah. Go to this safe zone. There is no safe zone, and this is something very important. Meanwhile, they're slaughtering them as they are, as, as the poor population, you know, if you've seen these images, they'll make you cry. You know, children basically carrying babies and following their parents, and then they come under drone attack. So there are no safe zones. I don't want people to kind of be fooled by these declarations. And meanwhile, it's it's just it's killing uh, innocent civilians in Gaza. It's, it's literally that kind of cliche of shooting fish in a barrel. That's what yeah. Israel is doing. Yeah, it's shooting and, fish in a barrel. Yeah, and you, let let and we haven't even gotten into this level of detail, Jamal. But you know, Israel flies these uh, drones that are armed with machine guns and Hellfire missiles that operate twenty four seven. And in me, uh, I was in speaking with some of the doctors and nurses on the ground in Gaza. They described these drones literally uh, shooting at children, women, and civilians fleeing from one place to another place in Gaza, being shot and hunted down by drones. And then the injured kind of limp into these hospitals with these wounds that you just don't see with human beings, Jamal. So when when the story and the reality of this story com comes out, you know, we'll, whatever we're saying about, and I use this word grim, whatever we say about how grim it is, I can tell you from my discussions and what I'm hearing from my colleagues, it's much worse. Moving on to our last topic, and we have a few minutes to talk about it, just not too long. Basically, these uh, demonstrations at uh, U.S. campuses have now forced administrations to reevaluate their position on the divestment and reach agreements with with the uh, with some of them, yeah, the with the students, some of them. And so now there is something that's going on for people because these protests that rolled college campuses in late April and early May, you might start watching them to slow down. And that's the reason because the summer break is approaching. That's what they're counting on uh, school leaders at some universities. And also the school leaders at some universities have struck deals with student protesters while others resorted to calling law on law enforcement. So you have two groups. Some right. now are, right. that's how these things are ending. Either they're ending by force because they brought law enforcement, like what we saw happening at Columbia University and others and UCLA. And then others are saying, okay, we're going to listen to your demands. Maybe you have a point, which is basically the divestment. And that's why we're not seeing as many uh, of these uh, encampments. Um, be it at Harvard or or right here in the Bay Area, for example, the administrators at the University of California, Berkeley, negotiated an end to the schools in camp in this week. Uh, and uh, though Berkeley's chancellor passed the buck on whether divestment was feasible, she promised uh, to review all discrimination complaints associated with study abroad programs and agreed to examine the investment strategy of the school's foundation. As a graduate of UC Berkeley, <laughs> just I want to know. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe my English is poor. I don't understand what she what what she means by this. Okay, well, uh, we don't have enough time to go into it, and I've actually been speaking with the negotiators who negotiated with Chancellor Christ, uh, and I actually happen to know that Chancellor from other other work that I do at the university. But I will tell you. Chancellor Chris decided not to call the police. She decided to negotiate directly with the with the you know with the protesters. She decided to do something differently. And after hearing them out and discussing all the details, interestingly, when it comes to the complex finances of the University of California, she mm -hmm. as the chancellor at Berkeley has little to say about it. It really goes to the president and the regents of the entire UC system. So what Chancellor Chris did to the said to the protesters is that what's within my authority to look at, I will look at. What's not within my authority, you're going to have to go to the regents and you're going to have to go to President Drake, who's the president of the entire UC system, and deal with it there. 
after she said that, and after all the dust settled, uh, all 10 campuses of the University of California, by the way, Jamal, submitted a divestment plan to President mm -hmm. Drake and to the regents this week. So uh, even though it doesn't sound like it's a great solution at Cal, at Berkeley, it turned out to be one of the better resolutions from what's happening on the encampments of any other campus. Because if you look at UCLA, if you look at some of the other campuses where they let these right-wing extremist thugs attack uh, student protesters, actually the chancellor at Berkeley is looking like she handled it probably better than anybody else. Well, we're, we're going to keep an eye on this. You've been listening to Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to download the latest shows, and we'll talk to you next week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.